My name is Rebecca Blood. Um, I have the good fortune to be involved in this year's Expo and Policy Forum. I'm delighted to be in front of you today and add my welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your lunch schedule to join us. Um, it's my privilege to be here in front of one of my favorite topics panels, renewables, renewable trends. I'm a longtime advocate, both personally and professionally, working on these issues. I have a big piece of my heart that belongs to the hydropower community. And, um, but with that, we work together as a village in this town. So I'm pleased to have with us today some outstanding representatives from the renewable energy sector. I will introduce them and start on my left and have them give us less than 10 minutes, maybe 10 minutes max, um, overview of what's going on in their sector. So we have Jeff Leahy to my far left. He's the Deputy Executive Director for the National Hydropower Association here in town. We have Bill Hamlin. He's, with the, he's the Energy Policy Advisor for the Canadian Hydropower Association. Um, to my immediate right, we have Mona, Mona Khalil with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, Brie Rahm, to her right, now represents, as Vice President for Federal Affairs, the American Wind Energy Association. And to her right, my far right, is Christopher Mansour, VP Federal Affairs for the Solar Energy Industries Association. So with that, Jeff, you can sit and speak or stand and talk. I think I'll, I'll sit uh, and speak. So I just wanted to give you all a very quick introduction into the National Hydropower Association. We have over 230 members across uh, the country. Uh, but hydro is multiple technologies. I think everybody sort of thinks of conventional hydro when they think hydropower. But we also represent pump storage hydropower, which is the largest um, uh, energy storage technology in the US and in the world today. We also represent small hydropower projects like conduit in pipe uh, hydropower. Uh, project opportunities, as well as marine energy and the new energy, uh, the new, oh, there we go, the new wave and tidal uh, technologies uh, as well. So all of that together, however you generate power from water, uh, we represent you. What is our role? It's to create a better policy environment, uh, and that includes regulatory, tax, uh, market policy, to support the development of new projects, but also to preserve and to reinvest in the existing uh, system that we have, uh, particularly in the hydro side, as we're still looking to commercialize some of the newer technologies we see in marine energy and, and others. So I'm going to talk about um, these, but I would also want to put, point out from the very beginning, particularly for the marine energy technologies and some of the new technologies that are happening in conventional hydro, um, that uh, appropriations and support for DOE's R&D um, budget uh, is a critical issue as many of these projects and devices are in sort of their first or second stages and haven't yet gotten to commercialization. So I just wanted to put that out there up front. We've talked a little bit about that in the hall, some of the members of Congress, the importance of preserving uh, the R&D budgets for the Department of Energy and other agencies uh, that work to support uh, those initiatives. So what is the future or the trend for hydro? Over the last, I'd say about 10 years, we've seen a modest incremental growth in the hydropower industry. We've added about 2,000 megawatts uh, of capacity over the course uh, of the last 10 years. Uh, so basically, it's been flat with a, a modest increase. Uh, but the Department of Energy and others, when they've looked at the potential opportunity in our sector, have seen as much as 50 gigawatts by 2050 if the right policies are put in place. And we see that potential across all of the sectors. So I won't go into specifically about how that all breaks down, but if you were to Google hydropower vision report, um, that would come up. And it's sort of the Bible of the hydropower industry now. It's a, and I think there are very few people who have read all 543 pages of it. Uh, but if you're looking for any sort of fact uh, uh, information about the hydropower industry, I really would direct you uh, to that document. So we have all of this potential that's out there. You know, only 3% of dams have hydropower on them. We have these new technologies. We have new pump storage projects that are trying to be built. But what are the challenges that we're facing as an industry? And you know, I'm here to say that those challenges are significant. And for some sectors uh, of the industry, you know, they really are facing a crisis point with a lack of policy support for hydro that is comparable to that for other industries that my colleagues on this panel represent. Um, 
we all know the electricity sector is a highly competitive uh, sector, and uh, the policies in place or the lack thereof uh, for hydro is really making it almost impossible for my industry to compete economically uh, and to be an option that is a viable option, not only for new developers, but even for uh, the preservation of existing assets. So I'm briefly going to discuss some of these, and I, I will try to be very brief. Uh, regulatory. Uh, we need, hydro is the only uh, renewable resource that is our regulator is the federal government, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and many other of the federal resource agencies participate in that licensing process. And that process, along with project construction, can easily take eight to ten years. Um, that is a tremendous amount of time and is not in the same uh, scale as other resources. And um, we're not saying it should be equal. Um, there are some differences for hydropower that, that need to be uh, taken into account. But when you're looking at 8 to 10 years versus 18 months to tw 24 months, um, that alone drives investment to other resources and away from hydropower, even though the projects make a lot of economic sense. So in the long run. So we need a shorter, better coordinated, and less costly licensing process. And you know, I'm happy to report there's bipartisan legislation out there in both the House and the Senate that has made strides uh, that we're working on to hopefully see in, uh, enacted. Tax policy, the hydro and marine energy tax credits have expired. Again, some of my colleagues have been lucky. Their industries have long-term extensions. Uh, but we need to have those tax credits expired if we're going to be able to compete, again, uh, in, in the marketplace. And, and for pump storage, we're also working, and, and many of my colleagues here are also working on this as well, uh, an energy storage tax credit. Currently, there is no tax credit on the federal policy side uh, to support energy storage. We would like to see that enacted and in, in pump storage included. Uh, market policy, hydro is a flexible base load resource, um, but in the markets we need hydro and pump storage to be first recognized and second compensated for the grid uh, reliability services and resiliency services that it brings. Um, that is not always happening, and again, it's just yet another benefit that when you stack up all of these issues that are not getting recognized, compensated for, or treated differently than other resources uh, really puts us at a disadvantage. And lastly, with regards to policy, uh, I want to talk about state policies and just say hydro is not always recognized fully as a renewable energy resource, yet it is. Uh, NHA commissioned the Brattle Group last year to look at this, and they looked at state policies, particularly state RPS policies. Uh, and their analysis found that the hydro industry is currently missing out on $1.5 billion worth of revenue or, or value uh, annually because of their disparate treatment under state renewable portfolio standards. So um, again, it just sort of highlights how we're just at a different place uh, than, than other resources. So to wrap up, you know, our challenge, NHA's challenge, and the challenge that we are making to Congress and the administration and the state policymakers is how do we reevaluate and amend some of these policies to equal out some of these disparities that have been sort of baked into those policies over the course of the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, the grid has changed tremendously, and our, uh, our energy portfolio has changed tremendously over the last 20 to 30 years. I would say that it's changed for the better, uh, but at the same time, that also it, it is different. And so I think we need to look back and look at some of those policies with a different framework uh, and a different, a different lens where we are today versus where we were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, with that, I will stop, and I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Hi there, Bill Hamlin from the Canadian Hydropower Association, where um, our industry association representing primarily the Canadian Canadian generators. Is the volume on? Um, start with a, a couple of facts about Canadian hydropower. Hydropower is the leading form of electricity in Canada. It makes up about 60% of electricity generation. The North American uh, uh, electrical grid is highly integrated. The Canadian uh, utilities are, uh, are, are fully integrated in that system and it's highly mutual, uh, mutually beneficial to both sides. Like, uh huh. Is that better? Okay, sorry. Um, electricity flows both ways, delivering benefits on both sides of the border. 
but Canada is a net exporter to the United States. And uh, in fact, we supply 1% of the overall uh, electricity demand in the US. Uh, small percentage, but a small percentage of a very big number. And uh, our significance is, is much more important in several border states uh, where we make up a, a much more significant portion of the uh, uh, generation base. Hydropower is still under development, uh, development in, in Canada. Several projects are underway. Uh, in British Columbia on the west coast, Site C is a 1,100 megawatt plant. Uh, it's coming online in 2024. The Kiask generating station in Manitoba, almost 700 megawatts in 2021. Muskrat Falls in Newfoundland and Labrador on the far eastern coast is uh, going to deliver 824 megawatts starting in 2019. So there's a, a lot still underway in Canada in terms of greenfield development, and there's an enormous potential still, still left. Canada has the technical potential to double uh, its already uh, big Canadian uh, hydropower uh, installed capacity. Let me jump uh, for a minute to the Canadian climate change context, which is uh, considerably different than in the United States right now. Uh, Canada remains committed to the Paris Agreement. Uh, that requires us to reduce our emissions 30 percent by 2030. Uh, we're already 80 percent um, non-emitting in Canada. Uh, hydro makes up about 60 percent of generation. Uh, nuclear, wind, and solar make up another 20%, so, uh, but Canada has an objective to go beyond that 80% to 90% non-emitting by 2030. Many re regulations are already put in place, uh, but many more are being developed, uh, and that includes a carbon pricing system uh, nationally. Some provinces already have carbon pricing systems, this national program uh, is going to start delivering a price $10 a ton uh, across the economy uh, in, uh, by the end of this year and uh, go up $10 a year uh, to reach $50 a ton by 2022. So it's a significant program. Uh, Canada's also got a strategy towards meeting it, uh, it's long-term mid-century goals, and that's to reduce 80% by 80% uh, in 2050. And that's based on three pillars. Uh, increasing energy efficiency, electricity becoming 100% non-emitting, and electrification of much of the economy. Now those pillars aren't unusual. Th those, are the, those are the things that show up in every deep decarbonization study. Um, uh, but it, uh, and that kind of strategy necessitates the need for much more hydro, much more wind, much more solar. In Canada, the renewable associations are working together closely. So the Hydropower Association, Solar Industry Association, Wind Energy Association, and Marine Renewables are all working together to add, we share that vision uh, long-term vision uh, that uh, not emitting electricity can meet the majority of society's needs by the mid-century. We're working together because we recognize the synergies. Wind and solar are, are increasingly delivering low-cost energy, but coupled with hydro, you get the reliability, the flexibility, and the energy storage. If you pair those resources together, you can essentially deliver a system that's 100% renewable. A good example of uh, how wind and hydro are working together is the case study for Manitoba Hydro and Minnesota Power. These companies recognize uh, the need for more renewables, more energy storage, and a stronger grid. Minnesota Power's transformational 
plan involves moving from being predominantly a coal um, company to being one that's 60, 66% renewable. And that involves a large wind farm in North Dakota and new hydro development in Manitoba. It also requires transmission and energy storage. And Manitoba Hydro's reservoirs uh, provide that storage and balancing of the system, enabling uh, much, uh, much higher penetrations of wind. As, as Jeff was saying, hydropower provides many grid services. Uh, firmness of supply, seasonal storage, that can be really important for solar in northern regions. Uh, where there's more solar available in the summer and less in the, less in the winter. Uh, Multi-week storage, day-to-day -day storage, storage within the day uh, that allows you to shift uh, uh, solar production from the daytime to, to be used at night. And right down to the second-by-second, minute-by-minute flexibility that enhances system regulation, load following, and system stability. The problem is, um, as, as Jeff pointed out, uh, there's, there's no real incentives for those kind of services in today's marketplace. And as we move to higher penetrations of, of uh, intermittent renewables, we need to start building in uh, those incentives. Storage in perspective, um, the output of Tesla's huge gigafactory is producing between 35 and 50 gigawatt hours of year of battery storage. Huge amount. But if you compare that with the energy storage that's already provided in one province in Canada, the re reservoirs can hold water uh, and effectively act as a battery. It would take more than 4,500 years of full production from the gigafactory to produce the same amount of storage as already available in that one Canadian province. So the challenge is to produce the, the, um, the market signals that start leading um, the resources that we have to deliver those services we, we need. Conclusions. We have the opportunity to work together towards a future electricity system that's affordable, reliable, secure, and virtually free of emissions. Hydropower can enable that future, but to get there we need policies to discourage emissions and encourage non-emitting resources. We need more transmission and we need new and enhanced market mechanisms that reward flexibility, energy storage, and other new uh, system services uh, that will be required. Thank you. stand up just to get the change, to get the blood moving. <laughs> so thank you. My name is Mona Khalil. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey. It's great to be here today. I wanted to thank EESI and the Sustainable Energy Coalition as well as the caucus for having us here today. Um, some of you may not be familiar with USGS. I'll quickly go over a little bit of what we do, who we are. We're a federal agency, so un unlike uh, my colleagues here today, we uh, work for the Department of the Interior. We are their science agency, and that's kind of where we leave it. We don't do any policy or regulatory decisions, but we hope that our science can inform those decisions. One role that we play for the Department of the Interior uh, is what's called the uh, it's trust responsibilities. So that's where DOI is charged by law to manage uh, and protect species on public lands. Uh, species that are conserved uh, under or protected under a variety of acts. And so USGS helps with that function. And because energy projects can be built on public lands and they can also impact uh, species that are under protection, we become involved as a science agency that can help managers that, that manage these lands and, and protected species uh, by making decisions regarding permitting and siting of energy facilities. So putting that in context for today, the trends, 
uh, the trends would be maybe greater if there was less impact to wildlife, to fish from renewable energy. And this is one area that we're really trying to tackle is how do we uh, remove that barrier to more deployment. Um, so this makes uh, our research portfolio uh, relatively heavy in looking at energy impacts. So renewable energy has been getting great, um, uh, great progress. Uh, as you know, uh, and, and you can actually check this out in one of our maps that maps turbine uh, deployment across the country, there are now something like 40, 54,000 turbines, potentially more, on the landscape. Um, so this is providing great benefits. There's, there's no question about that. However, the impact to wildlife uh, still largely remains. And this is from both uh, uh, wind turbines, from hydropower development, even though there's been a lot of effort to uh, allow for fish passage, uh, there's room for improvement. Uh, so as a science agency with a very broad biological portfolio, in, in addition to all our hazards and water and uh, volcano work that you know probably know about, um, it, be, it does become our job to also apply a rigorous and scientific process to understand the risks that are associated with energy development. Some of this energy development is very, very new. Um, and so we don't fully understand those risks yet. And what I want to convey to you today is that essentially today uh, and in, the, um, in, in our history, we are focused on helping find win-win solutions for both natural resource conservation and also for meeting uh, society's needs for energy. That need keeps growing, so that's not something that we'll ever escape, it seems. Um, but also I want to mention that Department of Energy is a very big collaborator of ours and by joining forces we're able to do some uh, very in uh, innovative research and I'll give some examples of, of what it is that we're doing with DOE. To, um. But to give you again a little bit more context, I'm speaking here specifically about wildlife, about fish, you may be asking, aren't there bigger issues? You know, the, there's you, you just pointed out a bunch of new issues, but working in this field and speaking with energy companies, I am seeing that uh, impacts to birds, bats, fish are a hurdle. And if we can reduce those, uh, we could have more deployment. So uh, there are other factors that come into play with wildlife. Uh, they're an unruly bunch. We can't seem to tell them where to go or not to go. Uh, and there are diseases that are impacting uh, their population, such as for bats, it's white-nose syndrome, which is uh, having a lot of impacts on their population. And so this is one thing that we're trying to study, is how big of a problem um, is energy development relative to some other factors. So the good news is there are technologies and operational practices that can minimize impacts from renewable energy, uh, but we're still not where we'd like to be, uh, and this is where USGS can help. So I'll run through a couple of examples of research that's uh, relatively new, that's ongoing. We don't have results yet, but this is sort of the nature of USGS, is that as soon as we uh, answer one question, so we move on to the next one. Um, and work hard uh, to bring the rigor of science to, uh, to new questions and new solutions. So I assume you all know we, we do maps. So I'll start with um, our, this is like an old fashioned, very good uh, map to do hiking with and probably other things, but our state of the science, state of the art maps are now very interactive and I invite you to check out our newest uh, map that uh, shows wind turbine distributions across the country, and we worked with AWEA to put this together, as well as DOE, where you can see all the distribution of turbines. Why this is good? Well, other than for your own curiosity of wh where the turbines are, it also helps resource managers um, figure out, they can download this information, and they could see how that might overlap with migratory routes, for example, People are very interested where ungulates uh, spend their spring and summer and how they get between those two. And so you can see whether they will be crossing facilities along the way 
and you can also use that information um, to potentially cite projects in certain areas that are not overlapping with uh, wildlife. Uh, so again, I, I encourage you to check that out. Um, what we're spending a lot of our research effort on is to specifically figure out the overlap where energy is, the potential is, so we know where the wind blows or where there's good water flow or there's a lot of sun, but also to figure out where species are on the landscape and where they are not. And we think that if we can provide that kind of information to decision makers, they will be able to, uh, they'll have better information to make deci decisions with where um, facilities can be placed. I'll give you an example of the California condor. Uh, this is a species that was br brought back from the brink of extinction by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And technology is so good now that we can monitor uh, every move, basically, of, of a condor. And so we did a study recently with Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the state of California to figure out what type of airspace uh, condors prefer. And this is, again, for wind applications. So if condors fly above wind turbines most of the time, we're good. Uh, if they actually share, would share space with wind, then maybe we want to figure out where we don't put wind turbines. And through this kind of um, detailed research, we're able to find out that um, condors do actually spend most time above the height of turbines, um, they, but they really like ridges and ridge lines. And so if you want to be on the safe side and you don't want to strike down a condor, you would probably want to put your facility on flatter terrain where they are much more less likely to be above because they don't like to be stranded up, up low either. <laughs> so we're learning things about certain species that we didn't know before. And this is the kind of research that can help industry um, make those choices. Uh, one example on hydropower, we do have a whole uh, number of people, of biologists doing fish research and fish passage research. And we're very excited to start a new project with uh, the help of DOE funding, as well as the University of Massachusetts, that's looking at ways to help fish find their way when they're actually trying to make it across a dam. It turns out that once fish find a passage, they can cross, but um, sometimes they just can't figure out where that fish passage way is. And this project uses um, information on fish behavior and um, you know, other techniques to enhance uh, fish um, kind of honing towards where they need to go to cross. And we're very excited about that because it'll apply to a variety of species, but it's still just in the testing phase. And so these, these are the types of projects that um, we, we are busy with. So, I'll wrap it up. I hope that uh, these few examples illustrate a few ways how USGS can um, apply biological science, so our scientists, how they can work with engineers uh, to help develop and improve energy technologies that can help us achieve our goals. And so thank you. Hello, um, my name is Bree Rahm. I'm with the American Wind Energy Association. And um, I'm gonna go through some facts about the latest trends in wind power. And then I think I'm gonna cut my comments short so we have some time for some robust Q&A. Um, so forgive me for my uh, cheat sheet. I've only been on the job for about a month. So if you have any questions afterwards, I'm probably gonna take a pass. Um, the American Wind Energy Association is the trade association Oh. Oh. 
right. done. Okay, done. <laughs> um, everything I said was brilliant, by the way. <laughs> Dismissed. Um, in the United States, wind energy provided 255 million megawatts of power. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, million megawatts um, hours of generation to the electricity grid in 2017, supplying 6.3% of the nation's electricity. The impact is more pronounced at the state level. Um, at the state level, wind energy delivers over 30% of electricity produced in Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. And in 14 states, wind provides more than 10% of electricity. Last year, the industry grew 9%, adding over 7,000 megawatts of new wind power capacity. Currently, there are 54,000 wind turbines with a combined capacity, you got it right, um, with a combined capacity of almost 90,000 uh, megawatts operating in 41 states and the territories. That's enough capacity to power 27 million homes. On the jobs front, the uh, U.S. wind industry powers more American homes and businesses than ever before, and we employ over 105,000 um, uh, people in all 50 states. Today, there are over 500 wind-related manufacturing facilities producing components for the wind energy industry, and there are about 23,000 factory jobs from, from those manufacturing facilities. Wind projects and manufacturing facilities are present in 70% of U.S. congressional districts, including 75% of Republican districts and 62% of Democratic districts. In the 2007 um, OWEA annual market report, which is actually up here, and we do have some also at the OWEA booth at the exhibit, um, it has a fabulous map of all the congressional districts and where we are located. But it, um, it also has a ranking of the 10 top congressional districts for wind energy. And I think it's important to note that for um, Congressman Arrington in Texas, Thornberry also in Texas, and Lucas from Oklahoma, each have more wind in their districts than the entire state of California. Um, util and these are up here, and they have um, great maps of where the wind is and, and uh, section by section of um, megawatts by state. So utilities are investing more in wind than ever before. They're signing contracts for over 33 megawatts and announcing plans to own and operate 55 megawatts of wind capacity just in 2017 alone. In total, there's about 84 megawatts of wind power being developed and constructed under utility ownership. And one of the things that we're seeing is corporations such as Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook, and other non-utility purchasers are continuing to invest heavily in wind energy. Last year, non-utilities signed contracts for wind totaling more than 2,000 megawatts. Um, overall, non-utility purchasers have procu um, procured more than 9,100 megawatts of wind power. Um, I know this, uh, this panel is about trends, and actually AWEA does not make predictions, but we can say um, for 2018 that the outside consultants have estimated that we're looking at um, deploying between 10, or I'm sorry, 7 and 8 megawatts, um, I'm sorry, 7 and 8 gigawatts of wind. So 7 or 8 gigawatts of wind likely in 2018, and that is a number from our outside consultants. And so with that, I'm going to cut off my remarks and turn it over to my colleague from the solar industry. Well, that's not my, knock over your water. We're going to have the hydro guys come over here and fix it. <laughs> uh, I'm Christopher Manso. I'm the Vice President for Federal Affairs for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Um, it's interesting, many of my remarks would parallel exactly what Bree said in terms of where our industry has been and where it's going in the future. Um, <clears throat> Real quickly, the stats. So SIA is the trade association, like AWEA, for the entire uh, uh, supply chain uh, and, and sector of, for the solar industry in the United States. So everybody from the people who are making the polysilicon to put into uh, polysilicon crystalline, crystalline silicon cells, people making the cells, manufacturing the panels, manufacturing the racking systems, which uses a huge amount of uh, American uh, sto solar uh, steel and uh, aluminum uh, products from here in the United States, uh, to the people who are actually either installing them on rooftops or putting them on uh, utility scale projects. So right now we have about 250,000 Americans working in solar. This is uh, uh, combined with the, the wind people and the hydro and others were by far and away 
uh, much bigger uh, in terms of the employment impact we have on the American economy than some of the more conventional uh, and traditional sources of, of electrical generating capacity. Um, speaking of that, we had um, in 2017, solar was 30% of all new generating capacity in the United States. Uh, and actually in this first quarter uh, of this year, solar was 55% of all new generating capacity. So solar, uh, wind, natural gas, and hydro are really the, the, the new sources of electrical generating capacity that's coming on in the United States. Uh, you don't see too many utilities looking to purchase uh, new coal plants, and right now there's only one new nuclear plant under construction in, uh, in Georgia. Um, so this is where the utilities themselves are looking to purchase electricity from, and purchase those kind of, either purchase electricity or purchase the facilities outright. Um, one quick fact on that is that you're probably aware that many states have renewable portfolio standards which tell the utilities in that state you need to procure 30%, 20%, to 50% in some states of your electricity from renewable sources. Uh, while those are important drivers for our industry and also for the wind industry as well, uh, in 2017, utility scale projects on, on our solar uh, industry made up two thirds of all solar purchased in the United States. Of that purchased for the utility scale, that two thirds, two thirds of that were driven not by any state or, or federal or any or local requirement. They were all purchased because the utilities looked at solar and said, this is, the, this is where I want to get my electricity from, for whatever reason. And for the most part, I mean, these utility executives have you know, 20, 30 year uh, lenses that they, that they work through, uh, and they're not exactly you know, wild-eyed environmentalists or anything. But when they look at where should my utility be getting its electricity from, uh, they want to know a couple of things. What's the cost going to be? Uh, how, well, how much maintenance cost is it going to uh, require to be done? Um, and, and can it provide me with reliable uh, electrical output on a regular basis? And as far as, for, from our standpoint, for solar, solar is a good buy for a lot of these utilities because they get absolute, similar to what they would do with wind, absolute certainty on what their fuel costs are going to be. With a, with a uh, natural gas uh, generating uh, facility, uh, I believe it's something like 75 to 80 percent of the cost, the life cycle cost, 30 year life cycle cost, is the cost of the fuel. And while there's low natural gas prices now, they have no idea what natural gas prices are going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. With both solar and with wind and with hydro, they know exactly what their fuel costs are going to be. It's going to be zero. And that makes a lot of utility executives very happy. So that's where we're seeing a lot of, um, of utilities around the United States making that decision to go with renewables, to go with solar based on the pure econ economics of what's in the best interest of their ratepayers and their shareholders. Um, some of that's reflected, reflected in some of the, in the activities going on so far. So right now we've got about 56 uh, gigawatts of solar installed in the United States. Uh, our estimates are that will double, more than double, uh, uh, with an, adding an additional 61 uh, gigawatts over the next five years. Um, that's, uh, over the last 10 years, we've had an annual growth rate of about 59% per year. So, so it's growing uh, pretty, pretty quickly. On the, on the housing side, on the solar rooftop side, um, in 2016 we had about a million, we hit, we hit the first million uh, of, uh, installations uh, in the United States. And that includes all kinds of solar installations. So rooftop, on your home, or on a hardware store, or a large scale utility project. So we hit the first million in, in 2016. We'll, more than, we'll double that by the end of this year to two million. And we'll double that again to four million by uh, the end of 2023. So the growth on solar is exponentially uh, uh, booming, both on the rooftop, distributed generation, uh, sometimes it's called, uh, but also on the utility side. A um, couple other things, we have about 9,000 companies across the United States working in solar. Of that, about 85% of those companies have less than 20 employees. So it's a lot of small businesses uh, that are really driving this industry in the United States. Uh, right now we're only about 2% of electrical gener generating capacity in the United States, so we're trying to catch up to our sisters and brothers in uh, wind and hydro. Um, uh, but, but we should hit the, the 4 to 5% by that uh, 2023 time frame. Uh, I gotta look through my other fun facts here to throw out. Here. <laughs> uh, price is down. So the other interesting fact is that in, 20, in 2014, there's about 12 states where solar 
uh, hit what would be called grid parity with other source for, uh, sources of electrical capacity. That means we're able to be priced in a way that utilities say, you know, it's, everything's equal. Should I buy solar? Should I buy wind? Should I buy hydro? Should I buy uh, natural gas uh, to produce my electricity? So that was in 2014. We're in, we were at grid parity in 12 different states. As of tw at the end of 2017, we had grid parity in 27 states across the United States. So it started out kind of more of a niche market, you might want to say, in places like you know California, obviously, where more than half of our facilities are, uh, Arizona, Nevada, the, the logical sunshine states. But it has grown uh, across the United States um, to North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Massachusetts, New York, uh, New Jersey, all these places necessarily what you wouldn't think of being big sunshine. Minnesota is another big market right now. Texas is huge and getting bigger. Uh, and so there's the growth potential uh, is certainly there uh, for solar in the next uh, in the next few years. On prices alone, our uh, power production agreements are coming in at the range of between $28 uh, per megawatt hour to um, $45. Per megawatt hour, so that is actually in line with a lot of the other, with, you know, either wind, natural gas, or hydro in terms of pricing. So again, that's where these utilities are making the decision on pure, straight economics: what am I going to buy? Where am I going to get my electricity from? Um, I'm running out of fun facts, Bray. <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of the the outlook for the next few years, I think part of the problem that we've had, and I think a lot of you may have heard that. You know, we had prices drop by 52% over the last five years. That Those price declines have kind of leveled out in 2017, primarily because of federal policy, specifically the tariffs that uh, were imposed at the beginning of this year, 30% tariffs on imported uh, solar panels and cells from anywhere in the, United, in, in the world uh, were all going to be hit with a 30% tariff. Uh, so that had the impact of, of kind of stopping that decline in uh, prices for panels and for cells. Um, but we still see that there will be, uh, uh, prices are still going to continue to come down uh, over the next few years uh, with, with uh, um, both the cells and the panels, uh, which are the main component, obviously, for a solar system. Um, so, those, so those tariffs have had a significant impact. We've had just anecdotal uh, information so far. Uh, a couple of companies have announced that they've had to cancel or freeze uh, billions of dollars worth of projects that ordinarily would have gone forward without the, the, those tariffs in place. Uh, and so, you know, we remain concerned about the overall impact of these tariffs, and we certainly are concerned if there's any additional tariffs put on solar uh, products coming in from uh, other countries. Um, some people are concerned, why don't we make panels in the United States? You know, the American manufacturing uh, of cells and modules has always been more in the 10 to 20 to 50 megawatts per facility kind of uh, setups. Other countries, whether it's China, Thailand, Malaysia, they're doing gigawatts. Their factories produce gigawatts of cells and panels in a given year. So the economy of scale is such that it's, uh, it's extremely difficult for American uh, companies to get that kind of investment to actually uh, uh, come forward and, and start producing cells and panels in the United States. Um, and to my way of thinking, it's kind of a little backwards because no matter where the cells and panels come from, as soon as they get in the United States, they're using American sunshine to produce, you know, produce American electricity that's going to power American uh, homes, businesses, and, and, uh, and vehicles. So it's, it's almost irrelevant where those panels and cells come from. Um, so we're looking forward to continued growth. I mean, 2016 was a record year for, for our industry, primarily driven, again, by federal policy where the, the investment tax credit was getting ready to uh, expire uh, at the end of 2016. Uh, we were able to get that extended in 2015 out for another five years. We were able to maintain that in the most recent um, tax uh, um, uh, reform policy that just was put forward at the end of 2017, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, working very closely with our friends in, in uh, the wind industry. Uh, so we're looking forward to so, so hopefully some more stable environment on the federal side, as well as maybe even more supportive environment, policy environment on the state side, and happy to take questions. Round of applause for Thank you. Looks like we have just under 10 minutes for questions. I have a round of questions, and we absolutely invite audience members to um, also provide some questions. Just identify yourself. But let me go first. 
Um, I'll give every panel uh, member a chance to answer one of two or both of these questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is there a technology on the shelf that you can speak to and describe that if it comes to fruition, it will really get you over that barrier and present your technology, your resource, your program, um, make it available in every state that has the capability of doing water or solar or wind. Right now we think of hydro in the Northwest and other areas with great water, but what's that technology out there that can get us into those um, other potential sites that we don't think of, the same for solar and wind, and what you're doing with your information. So that's one question. The second one is, tell us if you um, are in Puerto Rico helping to redevelop um, one of our most important territories. If so, give us a highlight of that. Um, I'll start with Jeff, or? Oh, do you guys want to talk about Puerto Rico? Yeah, I, I, I would just say quickly on Puerto Rico that you know, there had been some uh, significant amount of solar and wind uh, operations in Puerto Rico uh, before the storms. Uh, for the most part, our, the facilities there survived these, whatever, 150 mile an hour winds uh, pretty much intact. There was some damage to some panels, um, but they were able to come through uh, for the most part uh, and survive um, the, the impact of the storms themselves. In the post, uh, you know, the reconstruction side, um, you know, so, several of our companies rushed uh, facilities into and equipment into Puerto Rico, particularly in places for, for hospitals and for schools to try to set up microgrids to keep the hospitals going in particular. Um, so there's a lot of potential in Puerto Rico for solar. The issue is, again, government policy. The, uh, um, is that, it's a, uh, what's, how do you pronounce the name of it? The, 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 yeah, the, um, P-U-R-P-A, yeah, PREPA. The, the PREPA. Yeah. It's the Puerto, Puerto Rican Rico, uh, Electric, electric Power, uh, Authority. Power Authority, right. Uh, they have not necessarily been that supportive of what our companies are trying to do there. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to dispatch solar and I believe wind uh, at last as opposed to trying to make use of those electrons first. Um, they're heavily dependent on fuel oil uh, driven generators, which are not exactly the most efficient way to go about powering your grid. Um, and so it's, it makes it a little difficult for um, uh, for our companies to get in there and do large-scale projects. And on the homeowner side, uh, the problem is a lot of people have difficulty uh, with title, proving title to their homes and um, uh, being able to show that they um, get the, you know, either get the loans or get the cash to do uh, sell, solar cells on their uh, solar panels on their rooftop. So. Thank you. Anybody else with a Puerto Rico update for us? Um, how about a technology that you would like to raise with this audience that could help your sector move forward? Or I'll, I'll jump in present. there very quickly. I think a lot of the issues in the hydro industry are not technological. I mean, we've been around for 100 years and we have proven technology that lasts a long time. Um, that being said, there are always uh, new advancements that are being made in, in, in the industry, but I think a lot of our issues that are holding us back are policy issues. But I'll just say that where we see a lot of advancement happening and a lot of interest is in small hydro, smaller projects, uh, and also in uh, different kinds of settings than the traditional settings. So in pipe, in conduit, irrigation canal type hydro. Um, again, as well, also the marine energy, ocean tidal, ocean wave uh, technologies, which really haven't um, gotten a chance, of, gotten a foothold yet because it's, it's been a technology issue in getting them commercialized. In Canada, yeah, not not much to add. Uh, the the innovations uh, tend to be in how we address uh, sort of the historic um, issues and the way we mitigate the environmental impacts. And um, <clears throat> I would I would say uh, more than any of the other traditional uh, generating sources, hydropower is obligated to internalize all of its off. Uh, environmental externalities and uh, so uh, there are technological advances that are happening but it's it's really innovation in how we tackle the environmental and social con considerations Understood. Mona, any? Um, sure just a few comments that um, it's it's really great when um, an interdisciplinary team can come together to develop technologies. I think we've seen benefits of incorporating biologists or ecologists and 
uh, designing new technologies, and there's certainly a lot of potential for that with um, what Jeff just mentioned about small hydro or hydro in new places that have been developed before. So doing that early on, I think, is, is really key, and that's where USGS can help, and certainly we aren't the only organization that can do that, but um, it's kind of like a version 2.0 of developing technologies where uh, you try and avoid issues before they um, arise. So that's all I'll say about that one. Yes, great. Uh, questions uh, I, from the I, audience. I would just say one thing on that, though, yes. Becky, is that yes. is uh, uh, storage. Uh, you know, Jeff alluded okay. to it with pump storage. Uh, we are all supportive of the idea of giving an uh, investment tax credit for storage. Uh, for, it, for electricity that comes from any source. It, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It's, it's a, you know, ecumenical in that respect. But for us uh, in solar, the storage, uh, it, and you see a lot more companies looking, they almost are requiring, they want to see solar, s storage with your solar facility. Uh, and so as the price on batteries comes down uh, very rapidly, uh, we just look forward to more innovations on that side in terms of increasing the manufacturing of, of batteries of any kind, uh, whether they're lithium ion or others. Um, is going to be crucial for making it possible to uh, expand the amount of solar that's on the on the grid in general. Absolutely, very important point. Anybody from the audience here, sir? Please identify yourself. So the question for those of you who may not be able to hear is that, that why, why is the number sort of 3% of dams generate power and 97% don't? Why is that number sort of stuck where it was? I think it's been a variety of, of different uh, reasons for that. I think that there are a, a significant portion of those dams where it just doesn't make environmental sense or economic sense. The, the projects are too small to be viable necessarily with, with the infrastructure in place. I think that's part of it. I think um, particularly now uh, when you see low natural gas prices and uh, other issues, it's just the, the, to put that kind of investment into a smaller project uh, where a lot of those dams are smaller projects. Um, you just can't make that investment work. For, you don't get the economies of scale. I think part of that is licensing costs uh, that do come into it and the amount of time. <clears throat> and then lastly, I think it's everything I said in my speech, which was policy. Uh, back when many of these policies for clean energy, renewable energy were put into place, there was a lot of existing hydro, but not a lot of existing everything else. And so in order to make sure that we created a market for new entrants, we excluded hydro, but we haven't necessarily gone back and updated some of those definitions even for new new power generation new new facilities so it's i think it's just a, a combination of all of that we're over time but i'll take one more question anybody else okay if not thank you very much for coming and thank you.